So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Neil Kalin, being joined by Michael Simpson and our special guest today, Lucy Barron. We're just going to give a minute or so for those registrants who registered to log in. So give us just a minute and we'll get started. And as usual, we will be done by two o'clock. So just give us a moment, please. Thank you. All right, we're doing good. We have some people on the line. So I think we're ready to go. We've got another uh, interesting group of cases to discuss. And even more important, we have a really fascinating person that Michael is going to be interviewing. So Lucy, you know, can you can you live up to that? You're going to be a really interesting person. Michael will ask you some great questions. He will draw out all of that fascinating information about you and your company. So let me share my screen and we'll get started. I'm also going to take myself off of the video because I was having some trouble yesterday with Zoom. So I'm going to stop sharing my video. All right, Neil. I I see your lovely uh, mug shot. What do you see now, Michael? Now I see the, the first slide, the what's up with us July 19th slide. Hey, excellent. Okay. So I'm still waiting. My little wheel is spinning, so I can't really do anything yet. Give me just a second and we'll let everybody know what we're going to be talking about today. Okay, so I'm back. I got kicked off already. Do you still see the screen or did that get, did that stop too? Um, I, I see your picture i see your okay. screen up and not the slides so you have to all right. all right share the screen with your slide i'm gonna do that again hopefully i won't there get it goes. Up. there you go all right perfect perfect okay good so thank everybody for joining us sorry for the little bit of the delay here and if i keep having problems michael i don't know you should i think i sent you the at least a draft of the of the presentation and maybe you could just take us through it. So let's go. What are we gonna be talking about today? Well, first of all, Michael, welcome back. Good to have you back after uh, last month, we had a guest substitute in for you. We've got a few cases to talk about. Borden versus Stiles, really kind of an interesting case about whether the statewide rent and eviction control laws apply to somebody who is an occupant, but is not paying. Then we have Child Help versus City of LA, which is really talks about the issue as when is a transfer by the city or an intent to transfer property by the city um, enforceable? Then we have our interview with Lucy. We're going to talk about Citric versus Vivera, an arbitration case regarding arbitra arbitrator disclosure. South Lake Tahoe Property Owners Group dealing with vacation rentals and whether there are vested rights to vacation rentals and RAR2 versus County of LA talking about what happens if there is a, um, a appeals board hearing for a property assessment. So let's get us started. Here we have it. First, I want to congratulate Michael. You're the proud dad of a 2023 graduate. So congratulations on that. Having put two kids through college, I know what it's like. It's always a pleasure when at least one of them gets through. So good news for you. And I can have two. So they're, they're twins. So I got both of them graduated at the same time. And one of them is an official rocket scientist. Oh, my goodness. Okay, well, <laughs> wow. Not everybody can say that. So that's great, Michael. I did not realize there was two. But, Michael, you did something yourself 
uh, last month too. So why don't you just spend a minute and tell us what you did? Well, <laughs> I'm now, they call it called to the bar of the Law Society of Ontario, Canada. So I'm now a Canadian lawyer, A. So I can say A as often as I want. I can say boot in a boot. I can say all those cute little Canadianisms now, even if I'm not really entirely Canadian. <laughs> well, con congratulations, Michael. It was a, a good month, and I guess that's going to make it a good year for you and your family. C congratulations. Yeah, hey, it, you know, <laughs> it's, it's good to know that my brain still works. I, mean, <laughs> I have a few bar admissions, and th th this is uh, 34 years later doing a whole nother set of bar exams so it was good okay well well good that's great and and canada should be happy to have you so so, so let's let's talk about our first case borden versus styles this is a fourth district court of appeal case and we'll go through some of the facts here uh styles was permitted to live in a residential unit owned by blackman and styles lived there without paying rent Styles had been working for Blackman for over 20 years. She was not paid a salary, but received use of the unit and expenses. And part of the part of the appeal it says, and she said the right to be taken care of after her death, or after his death, excuse me, after Blackman's death. So after Blackman passed away, the administrator for the estate, that's Borden, Sir Styles with a 30-day notice to quit. Style said, I'm not leaving. I like it here. Uh, both parties agreed, stipulated that Styles was a tenant at will. Both parties moved for summary judgment. What was Styles' uh, movement based on? Well, that there was no just cause grounds for eviction under 1946.2 of the Civil Code. That's the Tenant Protection Act of 2019. The administrator was, well, Styles, you were not in lawful possession. After Blackman died, you had no right to remain on the property. The statute only applies to an occupant who is in lawful possession of the property. Therefore, the statute doesn't apply. We didn't really have to worry about just grounds for eviction. You needed to move out. The trial court decided, no, no, no. The Tenant Protection Act does apply. It applies to tenancies at will. Styles is permitted to stay. It was appealed to the appellate division of the Superior Court. The appellate, the appellate division affirmed the trial court decision. Borden, the administrator, petitioned the Court of Appeal. And the Court of Appeal had sort of an interesting decision here. It said, notice of death terminates a hiring. And at that point, an occupant who remains would be in unlawful possession of the premises. So they're, they're making this kind of general statement. Sounds like, oh, this is going to be very favorable to the administrator. But the court goes on and says, well, you know what? There are actually factual questions as to what happened after Blackman passed away. What happened? When was Stiles notified of the death? Was there any kind of an agreement between Stiles and the administrator? Was rent paid that was accepted by the administrator? So there's these questions that need to be answered to determine whether there was actually some kind of tenancy that was created. And so the court says, in light of the foregoing, we do not need to decide whether Stiles' tenancy had been a tenancy at will, and we don't need to decide whether 1946.2 applies to tenancy at wills um, in general. And so I looked at this case, Michael, and I said, well, that's all fine and good, but when it gets remanded, what if the court says there was no tenancy created after Blackman's death? There was no payment of rent. There was no agreement with the administrator, right? Then you're right back to where you were for what got this case going up to the Court of Appeal in the first place, right? Because you, you don't have an answer to the basic question that was brought up on appeal, which is, is this a... They agreed that's a tenancy at will, but does 1946.2 apply to a tenancy at will? And I was looking at this case and I was thinking, well, I'm not sure how often somebody gives 
another person who's working for them use of a unit but there's so many other situations where I can think of where there's no rent being paid. Parents or children, for example, living with somebody who passes away. Uh, I hear in my line of work, story after story, that a boyfriend or a girlfriend lived with the deceased and doesn't want to move after the, after the, after the death. Um, there can be all sorts of other arrangements that come into play that don't involve the payment of rent. And it seems to me that the court really kind of skipped the big issue, sort of hoping that it would go away on remand, that they may find some sort of tenancy. But I was a little disappointed in the in the ruling here, Michael. What what's your say? So you're touched on three of what I call attorney secret material. So this is not an unusual set of facts. In fact, there are a lot of related facts, and I'm going to branch out a little bit here. First, when I see a case like this about a dead tenant or an employee, like a apartment manager that's terminated, there are tenants at will. And the story that the it's an employment agreement, but it's really a tenancy at will. And so people want to analyze it and say, originally, a long time ago, it was, you're an employee, the unit is a consideration or it's not say a requirement of your employment so when you're terminated as an employee you got to leave and the theory was you, it, you don't need to give even like three-day notice or 30-day notice you can say leave tomorrow I would never advise my clients in the past when this would come up the laws kind of changed a bit but I'd say just give them a 30-day notice and give them the option to become a tenant that's a whole other body of law with these employees that get terminated and if they started off as a tenant and then give them, you know, what's the rent that they should be paying, there's, there's a whole lot of law about this stuff. There's another set of law, and there's a, one famous case out of Los Angeles is called Miller and DeSatnik versus Bullock. I think it's like B-U-L-L-O-C-H. And Miller and DeSatnik versus Bullock is one of these dead tenant cases where somebody wanted to inherit a rent control apartment. And the bottom line is you can't, that the tenancy terminated with the dead tenant and that was the end of it. And that's still good law. But now there's a whole new cat of worms. <laughs> and on one hand, I hate to disclose it to the universe, but I think that my universe is pretty small on our What's Up audience. So all my What's Up um, audience members, I, I want to help them out a little bit, even if they come and use it against me, because with attorney secrets, Michael Simpkin knows another secret that you don't know. But if you look in the chat box and you're in the city of Los Angeles, you should know that after the end of January 2023, in the city of LA, be very careful, it's not the county of LA, but essentially every property is under a type of just cause eviction control protection. So if you have one of these at-will tenants, and I think to answer your question, Neil, the, the boyfriend or girlfriend that moves in and doesn't go away, or the niece or nephew that you're helping them out, and then they don't wanna leave, these potentially are a big problem as far as trying to evict them for no cause. You have to have cause. And then this is where we get into these other Michael Simpkin attorney secrets, which don't forget, www.attorneysecrets.com, to try to find a way around that. Because these at-will tenancies are going to be the one that drives the average lawyer crazy because the law that you think is the law from law school or before 2023 doesn't necessarily apply. In the big picture, I kind of agree with the holding, even if you don't like it. Well, I, I, just, I just thought that the court was really skipping the, the big issue and could have provided some more clarity. Matter of fact, I think, Michael, on a previous issue of what's, of what's up, we, we talked about a case involving L.A. rent control uh, and that, that a tenancy and that for purpose of L.A. rent control as opposed to statewide rent control, that the occupant would be covered under Los Angeles. So thank you for giving your 
your your statement and thank you for inserting something into the chat for everybody to look at. So so you agree. I'm disappointed with the decision. I thought the court had a real opportunity to establish something that would have impact statewide and and chose not to do it. So let's see about our next case, Michael. And I think you're going to be leading us off on child help versus city of LA. Okay. Also, remember the facts are important. All these appellate cases, you know, they generally want to focus on the facts and what they think is kind of fair in the totality of it. Um, all right. Child help. Another interesting city of Los Angeles case. Well, this case, as it turns out, I, I mean, I've done hundreds of trials, so I kind of know a lot of trial judges. I know both the trial judge and I know the appellate justice who issued the opinion. I have opinions about both of them, but this opinion I agree with. And I don't understand what's so difficult here, except the the tenant, it's this commercial tenant that wanted to, um, ha had a, in my eyes, it's really a verbal agreement, but they had a commitment from the city of Los Angeles that they would provide services for victims of child abuse that they could have free rent. And they relied upon that for, for decades, for a long time. And what's interesting is they discussed how local politics work. And I learned something here. I didn't know it. I mean, I'm not a local politic type lawyer. Um, but the tenant thought that they had an agreement that they sought to have enforced where the city um, had a resolution that they could, after 20 years, give for free this commercial property to this tenant to continue offering um, different services to victims of child abuse. Well, 20 years later, apparently the tenant wanted to start the process and the city people kind of changed their mind. And there was a lawsuit filed and the court went through all the reasons. So this is the basic case what happened. The, the court said that you can't, the city could pass a resolution that says we're going to do something, but the city must comply with the law. And this is one of those places, examples where cities have more rights than humans. <laughs> So if a city lies to you, if the city council flat out lies to you and gives you a resolution that says, we're going to give you something if you do this in exchange and you rely upon it for 20 years, too bad, because the law trumps whatever the city says. So there's no fraud cause of action against the city and something like this. Um, they said that the city can only give up public property. It's, and valuable public property, which I believe is anything over $5,000 um, with an ordinance, a specific ordinance. And they have to go through the whole process to decide if this is the highest and best use of the city property. And they didn't have that. So the appellate court, as did the trial court, um, granting summary judgment and eventually evicting the tenant after four amended pleadings said that, we're sorry, city council lied to you but you need a law that says sell it to you and there's an ordinance and there's a whole process. So um, this case is interesting that if you want to do business with the city, um, you better have someone advising you as to municipal law and know that city resolution is not a contract. And so you can't really rely upon that. Um, but I have no problem with the holding. It's, it seems it's very black letter law, the judge, and I can understand how the judge is thinking bent over backwards, but she did the right thing. I mean, it was black letter law. The city could not give this property away to this company. Well, I, I think I agree with you. I think the decision was the correct decision. I, I don't think it involved a particularly tricky area of the law. And some people may think that the that the tenant was a very sympathetic tenant. They're providing services to victims of child abuse for over 20 years. 
but the lease never said that the city would convey the property to them. It said the city would consider. So it's almost like uh, an agreement to potentially agree in the future, right? So there never was that affirmative promise. So I'm not sure that the city, you know, really was, or members of the city council had committed any fraud. If you look at the language of the lease, there was also information in the case that came out that the level of services that the tenant was providing had substantially diminished over the course of the years. And so at one point they were providing to, you know, uh, X number of victims of child abuse, and that had gone down significantly because they were directing victims to a, another location that they had that was not this location in LA. So the issue could have also come out that, you know, maybe they're going to be getting this property for nothing, but they're not really going to be continuing providing these, these child protective services going forward. But you're right, the legal issue, I don't think was a particularly controversial legal issue. So Michael, that takes us to- Wait, wait, Neil, but Neil, you know what I like about this case also? Back to the facts, I'm telling you, I have a theme every month, it's about the facts. There's this resolution, which is like, say this fraud, but the lease itself in quotes, and I didn't, I just have the appellate opinion, but the appellate opinion in quotes says that the lease said what you said, the city council, quote, will consider conveying its interest in the property, close quote, will consider. So the lease is really, that, that's, that's, that's not really binding, will consider. And then like you said, it, their services turned out not to be good. Um, also, there's a lot of interesting things in here that comes up every so often when we talk about these government cases about what's a ministerial duty. And they have some of the quotes that I've seen before about, you know, what what is a ministerial duty um you know what's a discretionary act and you know they, they talk about a lot of these things which I, I think it's good for most lawyers don't understand when you deal with government what's a ministerial duty so they talked about that yeah you're right so it's, there's a nice discussion about that and for those who find them dealing with government entities that may be an important issue for you to consider uh not one that we have time to go into further today what we do have time to go into further is our discussion with Lucy Barron. So, Lucy, I, I, I don't see your picture anymore, but there no, you sorry. are. Sorry, I've got a gardener Glad outside. You're back just with just us. A lot of noise. And, and Michael knows you much better than I do. So, I'm going to turn the interview over to Michael. All right. So, Neil, you know, um, Lucy. <laughs> Uh, Lucy, I'm going to tell you a secret, okay? I don't want you to be mad at me, but a long time ago, like over three decades ago, I remember being in an office and listening to these lawyers talk about alternative dispute resolution, and they're like, never, never do it. You lose all control. It's the worst thing. And I remember this one lawyer, because I worked for this guy, and I know that he knew you. And, and I think this must have been, you know, I'm a kid. So you're you're like beginning. I don't know you, but I remember listening to this guy go off like, I'll never do that. But times have changed and everybody does alternative dispute because you have control over the, the forum and the process, maybe not the outcome, but if you can have some control over the, the process, you might be able to affect the outcome for your clients. And um I just want to say that it, it, I've, I've just loved watching the progression of alternative dispute resolution, from, including mediations and arbitrations. Mediations, people jump on the bandwagon pretty quick because judges said you have to mediate and that's it. But the arbitrations have really picked up. And um, so what made you get started in this business? Uh, okay, well, I started 29 years ago, so next year is going to be 30 years, and that was before we even had the World Wide Web, so no internet, so it was just a really hard grind, um, <clears throat> and before open AI, which is going to be a whole new adventure for all of us, um, uh, the chat GPT, which is so controversial, 
or becoming more controversial. But anyway, so how did I start? I am a psychologist by practice. I have an MBA and um, I have seven children and my ex-husband moved back to Australia, which is where I grew up. I did live in Canada for a while there, Michael, but I lived in Montreal, which is a beautiful city and a lot colder than any place in Ontario. In any case, I've sort of like traveled and lived in various parts of the world. So I feel that I'm very, I belong everywhere and nowhere. Um, in any case, I got involved in some litigation. That's really how it started. And uh, I had, you know, as I've said, a lot of children to support my ex-husband moved back to Australia. And I got, and I thought that there had to be a better way to resolve disputes. That's really how it began. It was a nonsense case. It settled in the end for $5,000 and cost, you know, about $90,000 in legal fees. And I thought to myself, there's got to be a better way as a business person, I came into this from a business perspective. It was not driven by the legislature at that time, nor by the judicial system, nor by the lawyers like you or any of the other ones that I met along that path who kind of used to laugh at me. Everyone used to kind of laugh at me, you know, and they kind of thought that you kind of like I made this out of a shoebox, which was in a sense uh, not to, uh, you know, far away from the fact. And I looked at industries. I looked at um, banking, for example, and real estate, which is what you're talking about here, and construction and the financial markets and healthcare and insurance. And I thought there has to be a better way to resolve disputes. And so I thought if I went to the decision makers, I thought it was very decision, you know, whoever had the money and was going to pay for the cost were the people that were going to be involved in being ultimately um, committed to getting an outcome that might be to their satisfaction. And to me, the best way to do that was to have control over what that outcome might be. Now, of course, you know, mediation is not binding. I actually thought that mediation was going to be the future, not arbitration. I think there are two parallels in the court system, the public court system and the private court system. The private court system started off with arbitrations. The public court system, you all know because you practice in that. Out of that, only 1.3% of cases ever go to trial in case uh, you don't know on the state side, tiny, tiny numbers. So they will resolve along the way. And I just thought it was a good idea. This is really just my thinking. It was a good idea. And then going to, I don't know, CEOs, really the business sector and the Association of General Contractors, the American Association of Architects, the California Association of Realtors. It was a really brutal grind. I thought there had to be, so I came in as the end product user and I thought there had to be a better way to resolve disputes rather uh, than just litigate them. Until... Well, mediation is very common. There's a lot of contracts, like you said, construction agreements, rental agreements, where mm -hmm. they require mediation or there's a penalty, such as um, you can't get attorney's fees. That's right, but that wasn't the case in those days. See, that only evolved since. It was not the case. You know, the California Association of Realtors now has that provision but in those days, 29 years ago, that was not the situation. So a lot of things have changed. It's really become an industry. It's a total industry now. It's a parallel industry, parallel to what happens in the courts. But it is a very, in, you know, it's a totally different methodology by which to deal with litigation. So how do you think lawyers should go about choosing a alternative dispute resolution provider. There, there are a lot of choices. I think you have to look at the skill set of um, you know, the person that you're looking for or at. We um, develop websites, individual websites for each of our neutrals, and we ask them to provide us with case summaries, and that's the content that goes into the website. So it depends on the nature of your case. That's really important. Depends on, you know, often, the nature of your relationship with your client, sometimes with the opposing counsel. Um, we will get cases like somebody will ask for 
you know, who do you have for an intellectual property case that involves copyright in, uh, issues in um, the recording industry? As specific as that. So you have to look at what the neutral knows. And as I think you've seen over the years, when you were a judge and retiring and you went into the private sector, you were totally accepted immediately. It didn't really matter what your background was at all in any kind of capacity. That is not true anymore at all. Lawyers look for other attorneys. Attorneys tend to be excellent mediators and they tend to look for attorneys with substantive experience. So if you want someone in employment law or not just employment law, sexual harassment cases or wrongful termination or target cases, you actually look for someone with that area of expertise. So that's what they look for. I think that's really important. Price is an important combination. We, you know, uh, kind of operate with all kinds of cases, but concentrate a lot on the upper middle market. And our philosophy is that, um, particularly given mine, you know, coming from the end, that end as being the consumer, you know, of, um, you know, a scenario like mediation. I'm just focusing on mediation because mediation is really the big growth. Arbitration, even those cases that are set for arbitration, 90% of those will resolve. They will settle somewhere along the wayside. We are written into arbitration contracts, but a lot of those cases will resolve. But they look for expertise. They look for look for. Oh, so Lucy, I have, a, I have a question. Yes. I've noticed that I've had judicial officers that I thought were brilliant and very good judges. Yes. I've tried them as mediators and they were not very good. Yes. And true. I have, uh, there's some observations I have. Um, I've also had some judges that I thought were kind of wild and the wildest worked out really well in mediation. So I have a new opinion, which and it's not that new, but you know, mediation it usually gets down to just money. Okay, so you want to choose someone that knows something about the substance, but it's all about the money and getting people to want to see the risks and give something up and settle it. And I see that the stronger willed, not always, but often the stronger willed mediators that people get some trust in them just because they're like point blank this is how it's going to be those tend to work out but what what do you think i think it's a lot of it is a function of personality and how persuasive you are once you're off the bench i'll just concentrate on the judges for a moment you know judges are used to making decisions and they you know, when they have contacts with lawyers and certainly their clients, it's always, you know, don't come too close. You know, they don't have that ability to attract as well. I think it's, um, I think that is true. I think everything you said is really true. Um, I think it's a matter of being able to use your personality and the psychology of human behavior to understand the needs of the other side. And they're not always totally money driven. I mean, so, people have to express uh, themselves. They, in the mediation, in civil litigation, I, I think 98% of civil litigation is due to failure to communicate. And the mediation occurring early on is an opportunity for people to express themselves and you know get it off their chest, whatever. And then you need the mediator to have the skills to say, yes, you're right, but you're a little wrong here and that might turn out against you. And, you know, they always work both sides to make both sides think they're going to lose and then try to get more money out of one person than they thought they were going to pay. And it, it works out like that. It's an interesting little, you know, I don't want to say game, but process. But, Michael, can I ask Lucy a question? Sure. Yeah. So, Lucy, I'm, I'm curious about your, your business model, essentially. You started in Southern California. You now have a presence throughout the state of California. When did you expand and what made you decide to expand outside of just the region? I started in Los Angeles um, and then uh, opened an office downtown. And then once we knew how to operate an office offsite, you know, without as much technology or technological assistance and, you know, availability that we have today, we opened an office in San Francisco. 
And so uh, why San Francisco? Because San Francisco was really the financial capital of the state of California. And so I thought we could expand. I actually thought we could expand on a more national and international level. And we have to, uh, so I have this business model, this grandiose business model, but we actually have, because we get a lot of cases from around the country and we do get cases because of Zoom around the world as well. Um, we are the second largest ADR firm in the state of California. We are the third uh, largest ADR services company in the uh, country. The last year we had 15,630 thousand new cases which is phenomenal it's like you having over 50,000 brand new clients in one year that was just one year alone so that doesn't answer your question why did we decide to expand just because I thought there was a need and because I love this industry and I love what we do and we, you know we're not involved in the litigation side of it we're involved in the dispute resolution side of it and if we can help with arbitration selecting you know really good people the um actually we don't select them we offer them to you you make the selection you know in arbitrations and the, you make the selection in mediations but if we have a very, very talented group of neutrals available that's phenomenal for us and and recently we in the last year we recruited justice ming chin um as you may or may not know and then the chief in the last few months which is um Justice Kanto Sakuyui, which is, I think, phenomenal. So um, it's just a, it's, it's, a, it's a terrific industry. It's a terrific industry. Um, lawyers fight, you're gladiators, you do the best that you can, you know, and you're, you know, beating your chest, getting out there and being as strong and positive and knowledgeable and experienced as you possibly can. When you come to uh, our office, the dispute goes away. So the the additions that you've made that you just mentioned, certainly that's a that's a real commendation for your company and for you, right? I mean, you're the president, you're the CEO, you started the company, you know, it it it's yours. It, it, it reflects, I'm assuming that the company reflects everything that emanates from you. And and that is that's a real, as they say, feather in the cap of those recent additions that you've just made. Well, thank you. We love what we do and we have a great staff and we're very, very customer friendly and, and helpful and we do everything we possibly can to accommodate the lawyers so that you look good with your clients and um, <clears throat> the clients have lots of choices now, as you know, you know, with the availability of the internet, they can find people say you are your Google, they can find anything that they want ever about you. So they, ha they have lots of choices and we do everything we can to make sure that your case goes uh, the best way that it can if you bring it into the private sector. Well, I think that's wonderful. Michael, we need to wrap up. Is there any final words or questions you have for Lucy? Um, no, but it, uh, just so everybody knows for a long time, um, I don't know why, I think I saw Lucy in the hallway uh, and I would just walk up to her and I just figured she was the boss. I didn't know her, but I was just, I walked up and I asked her like, who would be a good mediator for a particular case? And she's, she's always, if she's there, she'll talk to you she'll give you her opinion. And she knows everybody. And I didn't know you're a psychologist. I know I, you told me you got a master's degree from McGill, but, but I can see the psychology and how important that is. So I encourage everybody, if you, if you see Lucy down the hall, she looks like Bonnie Tyler, a <laughs> Taylor. <laughs> so glad as you ever told me that. I'm so glad. <laughs> but um, just ask her, and Thank she you. she knows every she knows all of her mediators and arbitrators very well, and she'll help you out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me on the program. Sure. Very appreciated. And thank you. A pleasure having you, Lucy. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Michael. Sure. Thank you. You're free to, to listen if you want to be bored by some legal stuff. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. All right, Neil. So what's next on the agenda? So what's next is uh, an ADR case, not a mediation case, but an arbitration case. And it's Citric versus Vivera. And it was decided a little bit 
earlier this year. I kept trying to work it into one of our What's Up presentations. Finally got the chance to do it this month. And it involves a situation where you have an arbitrator. So this is a, a, a private arbitration, a non-consumer arbitration, right? Right, And you had some uh, someone who was providing professional services, uh, public relations services, had an arbitration agreement. The hirer did not pay the person who was performing the, the public relations services and to the tune of $300,000. There was an arbitration agreement. The, the parties went to arbitration. They selected an arbitrator. Uh, during the disclosure process, the arbitrator provided a disclosure as required by law and specifically said, and I'll read from the quote, well, the arbitrator will entertain offers of employment or new professional relationships from a party or lawyer in the arbitration while the current arbitration is pending, including offers to serve as a dispute resolution neutral in another case. And if this is a non-consumer arbitration, which it was, um, will not inform the parties if something like this comes up. Both parties received this disclosure. Both parties consented to the arbitrator. Well, lo and behold, what happens, you know, nine months later before the substantive arbitration hearing, the arbitrator was selected to serve as an arbitrator in another case by one of the parties. So the entity, in this case, it was JAMS, the entity said, well, no, we don't think the arbitrator needs to be disqualified because of the full disclosure that was made privately, excuse me, excuse me previously. The case went to arbitration. Interesting enough, the objecting party, in this case, it was Vavera, did not participate in the arbitration. Right. So somebody made a strategic decision. We're objecting, but we're trying to have the arbitrator disqualified. We are not going to participate in the arbitration. What what wound up happening? So this three hundred thousand dollar claim ballooned, I assume, with with fees and interest and the like ballooned to over five hundred thousand dollars. Vivera then sought to vacate the arbitration, claiming there was an inadequate disclosure. The trial court confirmed the arbitration award up on appeal. The appellate court also, an, also affirmed the decision, affirmed the award, confirmed the award, and said, this is very simple. There was a disclosure that was made. The parties were advised that the arbitrator might engage in another arbitration with one of the parties. They had the ability to refused to agree to that arbitrator in the first place. They did not. One of the arguments that Rivera made was, well, since Jan provided us this, this, this disclosure, right, everything kind of had to relate back. And the court said, that was just a courtesy. They never had to provide that to you at all. They were not required to under the disclosure requirements and under the agreement that you signed. So just kind of a cautionary tale, maybe you get all this disclosure requirements, you're a party, you're an attorney for a party, and you don't bother looking through them, right? If you don't look through those disclosure documents, it could come back and haunt you in the future. Michael? No, I agree. This is what, I think this is what happens. People don't pay attention to the disclosure documents. They get sent and the lawyers don't look at it and that's it. Um, you know, in the be the beginning of the case, they make it very clear also the difference between the consumer and non-consumer arbitrations and the disclosure requirements. So <laughs> uh, this is non-consumer. In fact, the, 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 the one party is what they call the crisis manager. So I guess um, there was a crisis by the other side. Yeah. Yeah, what... I, I suppose so. <laughs> At the... Can I mention one thing? Go ahead, Lucy. Where it says, you know, he sure. dot 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 entertain an office of employment or new professional relationships from a party or lawyer in the arbitration while the arbitration is pending, including offers to dispute to serve as a dispute resolution neutral in another case. 
that is very, very, very standard. That is what is on almost all of the disclosure statements that everyone will receive. If you want it otherwise, then you will have to bring it to the attention of the attorneys. Otherwise, that's what you will get. I'm just letting you know that is in all of the contracts and all of the disclosure provisions. Yeah, and, and it's we, have, we have three research attorneys, so we want, want to make sure that we follow this very, very carefully. We also would do not want to, you know, have our awards overturned. And we want to make sure that we're in total compliance. So the onus for that, if you want it to be different, is for the lawyer to make sure they read it and they bring it to the attention of the arbitrator and the dispute resolution provider firm, JAMS in this case. You know, Lucy, I have a question uh, from with ADR. I'm sorry, Neil. You're, you're Go ahead. Something? Ask the question. Oh, so I have a question, Lucy. Um, this is a completely private process. And I, I've recently had something with um, the American Arbitration Association where they, they really they really provide a very good service in this construction case that I was I was on. But with ADR services, because it's so private, even if you have a rule that says you have five days or 15 days to object and someone doesn't, right? would you reach out to people and say, you know, if there's no objection by the other side, this late disclosure is, you know, no objection was made, but they're objecting to it now. We want to make sure the parties are comfortable going forward. I mean, would you try to like bend over backwards to make sure that the parties are okay with whatever it is, or, or are you very- Michael, generally we would not. It's governed by statute, you know, statute deadlines and statute requirements. And we can, it's not proper for us to reach out to one side or the other and say, you have not responded. And therefore we're chasing you down to see, you know, whether you're in agreement or not. So you're um, really proceeding as a neutral. This is, these are the, the deadlines that the civil yeah. code has this deadline for this right. disclosure and that. And right. if right. you don't like it, then we're sorry, we have to, whatever. Okay. If you don't like it, you know, then you have to object within a certain, within a time frame. Hmm. You know, the same kind of thing when you have deadlines, you know, and statute requirements where you have to do certain things and you have certain days in which to file, you know, a motion and a certain, and an opposition and a reply, you know, they're not malleable, those dates. They're fixed. It has to be done within that time frame. So, you know, it's very, very clear at the beginning. We send the information we send out is very, very clear at the beginning. I'm sure Jams did the same thing. You can't come back later and say, well, you know, it wasn't, you know, there's another matter that came up and you didn't disclose it. I do want to tell you something with, with AAA though. <clears throat> AAA do not handle their own disclosures. They used to, but they don't. So when you do a case through AAA, it's, it's, uh, it, the responsibility for the disclosure lies with the arbitrator. In our firm, the, dis uh, the responsibility for the disclosure lies with the firm and the arbitrator. We make sure that you are totally covered. AAA had cases, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago where they did not disclose. And of course, it wasn't such a big issue in those days you know, having, I mean, really essentially the only way you can have an award overturned is for non-disclosure or fraud. I mean, that's your two avenues and that's it. Um, and then AAA, you know, a lot of people would come into the case or they'd go out or lawyers would change or lawyers would, you know, law firms would merge or there'd be all kinds of differences. So um, the American Arbitration Association leaves that disclosure process to the arbitrator himself or herself. So you have to be really careful to make sure that you read those papers very carefully. Yeah, so that, that maybe explains what happened with the subsequent disclosure. And that's that's good. I, I didn't know that. Okay. All right. Thank All right. you. Well, thank you. Well, if you ever want to know anything about disclosures, as I said, we have three research attorneys that work in-house. So just call us anytime. Always willing to help. We, we love that with our guests. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Well, clearly we're not going to have time to get through two more cases today. 
But Michael, you want to talk about your case? Do you think you can get through it in a few minutes to give us time to make some announcements? Or should we skip ahead to the one that I did, which probably would is not going to take so long? What do you think? This is a long case, but it's, it's I can do something really quick. We, we can go quickly with the South Lake Tahoe case. Okay, great. Um, it's just... <laughs> I think I'm the, the older I get, I, I kind of go back to becoming more academic and really enjoy these cases that are constitutional law and, and theoretical. But the South Lake Tahoe property owners group case versus the city of South Lake Tahoe, um, you know, what was about people wanting to rent out rooms or do Airbnb type rentals? And the essence of it was kind of interesting. Um, this is this is like a case that was decided upon an aspect of constitutional law that clearly was not when I went to law school or I I I'd never learned it, but it's something called the dormant commerce clause. Did you ever hear of that? Did you learn that about that, Neil? Dormant commerce clause? I can't remember anything from those law school days. I, I remember constitutional law. I kind of liked it, but this is this was like a completely new concept. But this, you know, the court affirmed part, reverse part, but they found that part of this, um, uh, you know, home rental that they had violated the dormant commerce clause. And, yeah. and that was, you know, impeding, you know, the interstate commerce is kind of just fascinating to me. Um, but basically, a city cannot. Um, regulate interstate and foreign commerce. And that, that's like the, the just, just part of it. And this whole law talked about vacation rentals and, you know, could you rent a room for 30 days max in the residential area, whatever. And they went through this whole thing and they, they, they didn't like how there were some exceptions here um, for you know, property owners living in the city that they could sublet their houses or rent out rooms from their houses, and that, that was the essence of it. What I see is that the city just has to revise their ordinance, and they won't have any problem with it. But it was just a fascinating case, and I just didn't know that there was such a thing called a dormant commerce clause. That's it. That's that's my short take on it. So, Michael, what what's your guess? Do you think the city would say for that exception where there were written that a, a a resident, right, somebody who whose primary property is the one that's being rented out in the short term, would have the right to rent it out for up to thirty total days during the year, but if it was a non-primary occupant, if it was not somebody's primary or principal place of residence, they would not have that exception. So they would not, they lost the ability to rent out for short term at all. Um, again, somebody who was living there basically said, okay, well, if you're living here, we'll kind of give you some special rights. You can do a short term rental, you know, for up to 30 days for the, for the whole year, right? 30, 30 total days for the whole year. But if you don't live here, we're not going to make that exception for you. So I'm I'm wondering, what do you think? Do you think they're going to say, well, we'll just apply that exception to everybody? Or do you think they're going to say, you know, no, no exceptions for anybody? You know, it's either it, it's just going to be no short term rentals at all outside of there was there was a certain area that that they allowed to have them. But outside of that area, you know, they may just say, nope, no exceptions for anybody. What do you think the city might do? Well, I, I think they have to have an exception for not more than 30 days per year for everybody. And I think in the South Lake Tahoe, I'm just guessing there's a lot of condos and, you know, this lawsuit was brought by some association of, you know, property managers that want to do this subletting business. And um, you have to make it open to everybody with the same exception. Okay. And not to say you if you're a human resident then you can sublet but if you're a corporate owner of the condo you can't so i think you just have to make it open to everybody to do this 30 day per year subletting yeah and, and that may be the way they go because I, I imagine the residents will be very unhappy if they lose the right 
to have you know that that 30 that right to rent out you know for no more than 30 days i i would assume that their constituents would not be happy if they said no no acceptance for anybody including residents they're going to have a lot of unhappy constituents uh, that that live in their city if that's the case if they choose that you know michael before we go into you know what's going to come up next you know through the real property section i see marty triano has posted something in the chat so take a look at it i have no idea marty says that it was the commerce clause that was the successful basis for throwing out local and state racial discrimination laws not the equal protection or due process clause so i had no idea i don't follow that area uh, at all so marty thanks for educating us it's certainly an area i know i really don't know anything about i just know you can't do it now but i didn't know what the basis was for those holdings so thank you marty for chiming in we appreciate that all right, so that's good. So thank you very much. So we're gonna we're just gonna skip ahead. I don't we'll we'll save RAR2 for the next what's up with us. And just wanted before we go, uh let you know what's coming up. And you know, there's probably more than the August 9th upcoming webinar. And I thought I had checked our website and put them in there, but I don't think I did because all I have showing oh Marty Chet's not visible to everybody. So I'm glad. So thank you, Roger, for telling us Marty's chat's not visible to everybody. I read to you exactly what Marty posted. So thank you. Thank you for letting us know about that. So what's coming up? There's at the very least, there's one coming up in August. And so next month, if there's more coming up, we'll get those posted as well on our What's Up With Us. As usual, well, Marty is our webinar chair. And Marty's been doing a great job contacting people and getting a whole bunch of webinars in the pipeline. So I'm sure next month you're going to see a lot more about what's coming up of the real property webinars. If you have an idea for something that's great, perfect. Uh, contact Marty at Marty, Marty at trianoburn.com. Again, we're always asked if you want to get published in our e news, you want to get published in our real property journal, we've got the contact information there, either Kyle or Brian. And Hey, if you're in Southern California and you want to have a real fun night, um, the return of hot August nights hasn't happened in a few years, of course, because of because of COVID and the pandemic, but it's coming back on August, August 16th. And I understand they've got a lot of really great fun activities planned. It's not just for lawyers, it's for anybody involved um, in a real estate related industry. So a nice, good way to catch up with people or maybe make some new contacts over the miniature golf course or something that they have planned there. Um, and good reminders about things to save the dates for. The CLA annual meeting is in September and it's gonna be back in San Diego this year. And if you're really thinking far ahead, we had a really wonderful real property law section retreat up in Sonoma this year. And they've already got it planned for next year. And it's going to be in Rancho Mirage at the Omni Rancho Las Palmas Resort and Spa. So just mark something down in your calendar, March 8th through 10th. It should be a really great time. That's it for us. I'm going to say my goodbye. I'm going to let Michael say his. And I don't want to go away without having a special thank you for Lucy for A, for consenting to be interviewed and giving us some wonderful information about you and your company, and B, for chiming in and letting our listeners know that your company is available to help them out um, and kind of point them in the right direction, as you said, you might be able to do because of the people you have on staff. So I'm going to stop, Michael and Lucy. <laughs> pleasure being here. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Lucy. It was a pleasure to learn something from you and laugh every time I talk to you. <laughs> thank you. Have a great week.